Hi, my name is Sam DeLuca, and I'm going to be telling you about the difference between a tool and a product using a, some lessons from the very niche industry of protein engineering. So uh, before we get into that, I just want to give you the fastest possible introduction to protein engineering. When I'm talking about protein engineering, I'm talking about designing proteins, the tiny machines in your body that do things to make them into drugs, not designing bulk protein powder that you buy in GNC when you're weightlifting. So protein engineering, nanobots, basically. So the... Um, thing about protein engineering is that it's been something people have been doing for, trying to do for like a really long time, going back decades, and up until really recently, like the past five or ten years, it's been basically incredibly difficult. Until all these AI tools come around, probably the most well-known of them is AlphaFold2, which came out of Google DeepMind. That's a model, you give it a protein sequence, it gives you a 3D structure. It works really well. People talked about it having solved the problem of protein folding, and that's barely an exaggeration. It took protein folding and made it something that you could really do pretty effectively, and it's really fast, and it, it's great, and it really changed one part of the industry, right? Because knowing what a protein looks like is just a small little piece of the puzzle, and it's one piece of a very long puzzle. So, you know your protein structure. You need other tools to actually modify the structure because you're doing protein engineering, not just protein structure. So if you're trying to make a protein engineering product, you need to be thinking about the whole process that you're a part of, which is, in our case, the very first step of a process that can go on for you know more than a decade. And there's not just computational work. There's this loop between computational work and real-world testing. So in order to take your tool and make it part of a product, you really need to understand how that loop works, and you need to understand how your tool, how your product fits into the world around it, and the industry around it, and the people who are going to be using it. And so some things that you need to think about are like, what are the problems that your customers are actually trying to solve? And what conditions are they working under in terms of their funding, their time pressures, their physical resources, their regulatory concerns? Your customers probably aren't working in the same conditions that you are. And if they've been doing that work for a really long time, they might not really be aware of what conditions they're dealing with and the constraints they're dealing with and how those constraints deal can um, differ from the constraints that you're thinking about as a software engineer, as an operations person. So you gotta be really have a good idea of I'm building this product, who is it actually for? Because unless you're making like, you know, a Kubernetes tool and you're a Kubernetes person, it's not for you, it's for someone else. So the way that we did this, we're a spin-off of a company called Cyrus, and we decided we're gonna be our own customer. We started working on this software in like 2014. We spent years doing contract research to understand what is the world that people who really do protein engineering for a living uh, what is that world like? And we learned a lot about how to do protein engineering. And we learned a lot of stuff that wasn't obvious and that our customers couldn't necessarily really articulate to us that, that we learned by doing with it. And we got way too good at it, and Cyrus just turned into a drug company and jettisoned its software team, and that's why we're a spinoff. So there is, there is a downside to being your own customer, is that you can literally become your own customer, um, which is what happened for Cyrus, to Cyrus. So um, we learned some interesting things. We learned that biotech companies, they don't have a lot of computational resources. They want to do computational biology. They don't necessarily have a cluster. They don't have an ops team. Cloud computing would be great, but oftentimes they're really cautious about it because they have really valuable intellectual property and they're scared of what might happen to it. We learned that these, all of these molecular modeling tools, and especially the new AI tools, they require a lot of training to interpret the results. They're often really easy to use, but they're hard to deploy and they're hard to understand what the results actually mean. And the bad practices aren't actually obvious at all necessarily. You can really mislead people. So beyond just the training, the UX needs to guide people into making the right decisions and not guide them down the path of misusing these tools. 
every project that someone gives you is going to be totally different. So you need to be able to develop features quickly. And all the training data in this field is public. So your foundation model has no mode around it, and everyone will just copy it as soon as you release it. So your product needs to be something else, not just a model. So the reason this matters is that like, we are, I think, in a golden age of like really cool tools with niche applications. And you need to make a good product that solves real problems and not just win a benchmark contest. So.